Deanna Troy needs a real chocolate sundae when she talks with her mom. The Federation would like to negotiate a trade agreement in which they could acquire Caledonia's rich deposits of Trillium-323. And who needs rational when your toes curl up? Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 3, Episode 8, The Price, written by Hannah Louise Shear, directed by Robert Shearer. Uh, this was November 11th, 1989. Where were you? We have a very special guest today. It is Hannah Louise Shearer. What a coincidence. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing just fine. Thanks very much. Doing good. Uh, You're welcome. Wait, it was 1989? November 11th, 1980. Oh, I thought it was later than that. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is super exciting. We cannot wait to dive into this episode with you. You've written a bunch of episodes. You've been a big part of our show so far. We've been talking about you a ton. It's so yeah. great to have you finally here. Do you want to point out everybody very quickly please go to creationentertainment.com. That's creationent.com. Check out Trek Tour. Trek to San Francisco, March 8th through 10th. There are dozens of Star Trek celebrities there, including Sirach Lofton. Uh, yes, I will sir. be one of the main hosts of the show. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to have a seventh rule panel. There's going to be all your favorite celebrities and we cannot wait to go. Get your tickets and your hotel at creationent.com. Once again, that's March 8th through 10th. All right, let's get into this. Yeah. So, Hannah, where did this idea come from? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to go back into my memory because uh, I was approached by my... Pillar, I wasn't on the show at the time. So Mike approached me with um, Rick Berman, uh, who had fired me earlier, saying that they wanted a, <laughs> yeah, they wanted me to come up with some ideas. And I think at the time I felt that Deanna wasn't really being utilized enough, that she, you know, that there was a lot more that you could tell about her story. So I pitched the idea of her falling in love and um, with somebody who was turned out, would turn out not to be so good and Riker would be jealous. So, you know, they thought that was kind of interesting. And at that time, I think, I don't know, it felt like there were 20 people on staff. I know that's not the case. But when you're a freelance writer and you walk into a room with an executive producer and the staff, it can be pretty intimidating. So they all had ideas, however many there were people in the room. As I said, 20, 25, it was probably six. So <laughs> you know, <laughs> they all had ideas of how this should go. And I, I remember getting into an argument, I don't remember with whom, and we were going back and forth really quite a bit about this. And Mike Pillar was on the sidelines and he was going, this, this is fantastic. Put this in the script, this argument. So it was huh. really interesting experience and i if i remember correctly because you know it, it's a long time ago it's like 30 years yep. or something um if i remember the argument was about deanna reading this guy's mind or you know he's hearing what he was feeling knowing and not mm -hmm. telling him that she knew that she was a beta. So um, that's what the argument was about. And, and I said that sucks in a relationship. You can't, you know, that that makes her, and, and seeing as how he was, turned out to be a bad guy who also had the same abilities, um, that's what made it kind of kind of interesting that, that she had no compunction about reading him. Mm -hmm. Um because it's what she did automatically without telling him. 
So it was, uh, to me, it was a very interesting concept. It wasn't as much as the, the love story, um, which I, I wished had been um, deeper in the end. But um, it was nice to see her. I, I remember that. Well, it's really tough to have a a deep love connection in 43 minutes. Very. Yeah. Very. Which is something we've said before while we watch these episodes. Uh, Ryan is, you know, famous for saying it's hard to believe somebody falling in love in one episode. And I thought that you did a great job uh, addressing that in the dialogue um, when – uh, Troy says, is it possible to fall in love in one day? And <laughs> she's talking with uh, Dr. Crusher about, you know, the feeling she's having. And that helped me as the audience yeah. believe the one day falling in love more because it's very unlikely. But you acknowledge that in the dialogue. I thought that was great. The, um, you know, people feel like they fall in love all the time. I mean, they're there are immediate attractions and whatever we want to call it, it's there. I mean, it's a normal human reaction, even though she's only half human, um, to to have instant reactions, emotional reactions to people. So that doesn't bother me as much. I mean, you know, as you as you grow up in this world, you find yourself becoming intensely attracted and just you can do it in a few minutes too. So, and uh, and I think it it happens a lot. So, um, but I'm glad you weren't bothered by it. That's, yeah, you know. you know, it really hit me hard how quickly the 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 guy just walks right in. He starts playing with her hair, and she's okay with it. So I was like, okay, one of two things: <laughs> they have a past. <laughs> or there's something about this guy that we don't know yet, you know, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm like, there's got to be something. It, it, this is not a normal interaction. There's got, And then you did eventually reveal that he's one quarter beta zoid and that he's empathic. And that's where that connection came from. So that way, a lot of us that are kind of, you know, like I'm kind of a fussy duddy. So I'm sitting there going like, what's I don't get it. You know, it allows me to relax and say, OK. I get it now and I can go along with this story. How important was it for you to incorporate that, you know, that element in the story? Was there something where it wasn't originally like that and then you added that he was a beta zoid? Or no, was that always the no, case? no. Um, really underlying when you think about it, they were both hiding something from each other. They were hiding who they really were. And on some level, they both knew it, you know, because not and not just because they had, you know, they were half and quarter betazoid, but because on some level, some emotional level, we know these things. We we yes. we know. And I, I know that's difficult. It starts with that look, by the way. I've, I've been in that position, too. It, it's that look and that first look that they when they locked eyes. There was a magnetism there. It was unspoken, but we've all had that. I mean, that's how you eventually get into the relationship that you get into because that magnetism you recognize. Uh, and sometimes it's like this handle, you know, and sometimes it's like this, but it's still a magnetism. Yes. So um, that happens too. It, it, it just, it depends. I felt it. I felt it. What She looked over and she, and she looks at this guy and of course he's handsome and he has the 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 blue eyes and you know he's the piercing look so all of those things work towards his favor but still the chemistry was there and then that's what you highlighted in the in the script that's what was performed i think well um yes he was not my favorite <laughs> okay uh, especially i mean think about it jonathan uh, frakes is a very strong character and you know, very magnetic, and the two of them always were very, uh, um, you know, they they had an intimacy based on past 
on their past relationship. And also they knew each other and they were very fond of each other. So it had to be something that was different than that, something that was so intrinsic to each of them that um, that it would feel stronger in the moment than the past relationship she had had, which was standing right next to her, basically. That's mm-hmm. not easy to do. And then he brings it up, too. I thought that was interesting when he comes up and he says, what about Commander Riker? And and he he goes right to that hot button of emotion that she has, you know, that this suppressed kind of uh, this undertone of chemistry between her and Riker. And he goes right for that. And I'm thinking, boy, you're about to mess this thing up. The last thing you do is bring up another guy when you're trying to do your thing. (laughs) Actually, it just shows how well he knows her. Yes. As quickly as that happened. So he knew what he was doing. You know, uh, um, whether that was a trick of his mind or it it was probably a combination. And it's been a long time, but it was probably a combination of that, of his abilities as well as his emotional attraction to her. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Did he uh, was he inspired by that character? Uh, Was he inspired by somebody that you had seen in real life? Because a lot of times will pull from something or someone, you know, or you'll say, you know, you watch this guy and you're like, boy, does that actually work? I guess it did. And then you're like, maybe I can incorporate that into this story. Or did, was this just. Okay. Well, you know, this was a driven? long time ago, so I don't remember that aspect of it, but I, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, so much of it is based um, on her because she's the one we care about. She's the character we know. So what you have to do is build the opposite to her in whatever way or what you know is going to, that she is going to respond to the character that you know. Um, I don't think so. I think he was basically, you know, a, a creation of the moment that would uh, that that would be good for her. That would that would suit part of her story, you know, part of her personal growth forward. So, mm-hmm. no. You, you referenced also <clears throat> this kind of poker uh, in this episode. You know, the Riker says, "Is that a game?" You know, po- poker. What are you talking about? I don't. You know, I know nothing oh. about it. Um, wasn't he that, lying? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah he was lying. Yeah. And, it, <laughs> yeah. and that was a I'm callback. sorry, he was yeah. bluffing. He bluffing. was bluffing. Oh, there you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. But it was a callback to another episode that people, the fans love, which is the when when everybody's playing poker together and that on the table. Um, and so I thought that was a clever thing to to bring the poker reference back up again this many episodes later. It shows a little. It shows continuity for me. Um, the, the the other thing I wanted to ask you though was the concept of the wormhole and a stable wormhole eventually becomes the basis of Deep Space Nine, and I can't help but watch it and think, well, wait a minute, is this did they find the wormhole that Deep Space Nine was talking about or is centered around? And it almost seems like. You you created Deep Space Nine, or one of the <laughs> fundamental themes of it in this episode is that which I have not gotten a dime. Just so you know, <laughs> okay. yet, okay. yet, there's uh, yet, no. No. Yeah. 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 yeah, or ever. But uh, <laughs> what's really interesting to me about the wormhole part is that was nowhere in the first draft. It was an entirely different story set on the planet that they were um, near. And they were going for the rights, it was mining rights for some kind of very rare, look, it's a long time ago, so I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was set, you know, deep underground and it was a fight over mining rights, basically. 
And uh, when when I finished the first draft, uh, Mike Mike said this doesn't work. I mean, this aspect of the story. I mean, and he was dead on. He was right. He said, "Let's um, let's do something more spacey." I mean, <laughs> not those words, but mm-hmm. let's you know. He said, "This could be anything. This could be any show. It could be any time." He said. Well, how, how about doing a, a wormhole that so it was really pillars idea not mine just so you know so they can okay pay pillars to stay so but then i had to write an entirely different story in the second draft as to what it is and it not I'm not saying it wasn't difficult, but it's not as difficult as it sounds because what you're doing is you're replacing one catastrophe for another um, with different descriptions. Uh, the the um, you know what's at stake is the same. The and the wormhole was never the story. the the, the whole The thing was always Deanna's story. So uh, this was, it just wasn't as important as the emotional story. The, However, the wormhole, I thought, worked out really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did too. Yeah. So, so I was very glad to have been able to do that a second time and, and make it a much better script um, with much higher stakes. Mm-hmm. Because the you know the first time around it it didn't play as well as as that so so I have to credit Mike Pillar for that that was absolutely his idea and uh, and then then we made it work. Yeah, there were a lot of really cool uh, like poker references, especially towards the end when Riker is speaking with Rawl. My favorite line of the episode, I think, is when Rawl says. You're much better than you realize. And Riker says, Oh, I hope I'm better than you realize. Yeah. I'm like, that is I, that yeah, is such yeah. a Riker. That is perfect. Yeah, it was really right. That. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And of course, you know, Jonathan Frakes just ate that line up for yeah. dinner. He yeah. just has it the, the yeah. gleam in his eyes, but I hope I'm better than you realize. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Uh, talk about somebody perfect for a role. Really, and uh, yeah, he's a great guy. So, um, and um, actually, I really like the line that you wrote, uh, where it's, oh, it's also a Riker line in which he, you know, Rawls trying to one up him and, and bring out the fact that he's going to take Troy away from him. Essentially, he's won his girl over. And I love what Riker says to the to the effect of, you know, this is the first time I've seen you make a mistake because seeing Diana happy would be the greatest thing, it would be a great joy for me. So if you could bring mm-hmm. happiness to her, that doesn't hurt me. I thought, brilliant. What a, no, that's what a lovely thing to say. And, and you know, and I, I, you know, I felt like he he meant it. I felt, I, I, I really felt that their relationship was so complex. And it had so many, so many levels to it. And, and I'm sure, and that continued throughout the series. Honestly, I, I don't know where they ended up. I don't, I mean, I, you know, I. I I'm married. Oh, did they? <laughs> well, that's good to know. Yes. Okay. Yes. I had a part in that. That's good. Yeah, yeah they ended up, they end up married there and they're together in the, the new series of Picard. Oh, good. So, yes. But yeah. um, he was always, to me, a man of great integrity, his character, um, and, and Jonathan as well. But his character was, you know, he's the stand-up hero. Uh, uh, Picard, I don't mean Picard wasn't a hero, but he, you know, he had his ups and downs. And he, even though he, he Picard... The, He's played so stoically for most of the time. You know, um, y- you know that Riker is is the good guy. Uh, to mm-hmm. me, to me, he's the uh, getting the other script. One of the scripts I wrote was so difficult to give Picard any emotion because he didn't like to 
play a lot of emotion. You know, he he played it all very closed uh, in because, uh, you know, that's what the captain was. Not not uh, when you're the captain of a starship, you're not supposed to have a lot of emotion. And Riker, right. so Riker was the one who played all the emotion. Mm -hmm. That's you know, there's another element that I don't know if you created in Star Trek lore or added to it, but Star Trek fans know that Deanna Troy loves chocolate. That's her uh -huh. thing, and I don't think that we've seen that before this no. episode no so her talking about i want a real chocolate sundae yeah. star trek fans watch this scene and go i didn't know that <laughs> that's where it started because from there that I mean, is even, where it started well yeah all the way because, to like go ahead yeah no i love chocolate <laughs> who does <Yeah>. it? <laughs> okay. what I I, it's not just that i love chocolate it, it's it's a trope actually that women, especially when they're in love, involved, upset, broken up, you know, they gravitate toward chocolate. And I thought, mm -hmm. and it's not like I remember thinking this, but I'm feeling it now. So I'm sure that this is where it originated. Women depend on chocolate when they're emotionally um, at, at odds. So, mm -hmm. and I thought, why not? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what year this is, you know, you have, she's a woman, first and foremost, so, hey, wouldn't it be interesting if, you know, you had chocolate? Mm -hmm. And it gives us all and, a little chuckle. A little chocolate. Well, for me, it set the tone, like you say, uh, it set the tone for me that she was not in a good place. Um, she was, she was feeling uneasy about some place in her life. and. She wanted something to give her some stability, something that b may, brings her back to a comfortable place in her life. And that's what she was looking for. That's why she was literally arguing with the computer. Like, no, I don't want that fake stuff. That, you know, give me a real one, you know, and that she wants that authentic feeling. And, and I guess of love, of comfort, of, you know, it's some kind of uh, emotional bliss, which this character provided for her in the exact right moment. I thought that was one of the clever tools. I don't remember. I I don't remember where she and, and Jonathan were in their relationship at this point. But yeah, it, it was uneasy. It was, they weren't committed to each other. They were, uh, they weren't committed to each other. And if you think about it, you know, being a woman without a family on a starship in the middle of, nowhere i mean having adventures and also she's she was um supremely uh, sensitive i mean literally sensitive to other people's thoughts and she had to restrain herself from hearing i, I, I think the way they played it um, i don't remember exactly it was a long time ago was that she couldn't hear the words you know but she definitely got the feelings and this was something that had been was debated in the first season uh in the writers uh such as it was with um gene and <laughs> maurice and yeah and the lawyer um so yeah mazelich yeah mazelich yeah. Yeah. leonard mazelich yeah. yeah i never had a problem with him just so you know hmm. never had a problem yes, with him because no he was very good to me. He was very nice to me because he respected my father. Oh. Literally. Oh. So he was he was nice to me. Yeah. He knew my father. So my father was, oh, he was a, much nicer. He was a made guy, me. huh? Huh? <laughs> no, he the wasn't. Made guy. He wasn't okay. my main guy. But he, you know, he didn't treat me like crap like he treated everybody else. So I got well, very good. happy with that. Yeah. That's so, good. Yeah. yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, because we haven't we haven't heard anyone say good things. I know that's about, it's so definitely the first. Somebody, to, no, no, no. <laughs> I have nothing good to say about him. But nothing bad. But I have nothing bad to say about him because, okay. as I say, I I was lucky. I was protected. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, speaking of which, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sirac. I was going to change gears. No. Oh yeah, I, I, can't, I can't. I can I have to ask you about killing Tasha Yar. I just uh, because we haven't had you oh. on and.
I, I know you probably get oh. this all the time. It's yeah, we should have started with that. You're right. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but I, I have to bring it up. It, is it something that people always come to you about? Is it Nobody is talks it, to me about it because most people don't know that I did it. So okay. um, there you go. We know. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, it was, uh, I have to say that was probably the hardest st- script I ever had to write. I, it was a rewrite. You know that. Yeah. It took me longer to rewrite that script than than any feature I have ever written. I won't say it took me as long as my book because nothing took as long as that. But <laughs> that was forever. Wow. But this was a brutal script. The original script had virtually no dialogue in it, um, which is why they never did anything with it. The fact that she wanted... Was that oily mud character in that original script, the the, the muddy... Armus. Armus character? And the yes. only reason he's Armus is because the name I gave him apparently was another name for God that some crew <laughs> member objected to. So I named him was... Armus after... Okay. Bird Armus, who right? We saw that there's somebody named <laughs> Armus. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah, it okay. was just easier. So, um, oh, what happened? Here's the. Uh, oh. Oh. This is you and Denise <laughs> that was on the at the strike, on huh? the picket at line. the writer strike. Yeah, yeah, on the picket line. I yeah. killed Tasha Yar. Beware, AMPTP. Yeah. This lady means oh, wow. business. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud. Well, that's of great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After all of these years, you guys finally reconnected in, in that moment. Yeah, she saw that we're walking down, and she saw the sign, and she said, "Wait, wait, I'm Tasha Yar." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was very, it was very cute. Um, that's amazing. Okay, so yeah. doing that script was kind of brutal, uh, and it took a lot of work. It really, it took a lot of work. Yeah. First of all, you're you're killing off a main character, and you you want to give it the the weight that it deserves and the goodbye that it deserves. So um, it was hard. It was it was really really hard. I did a a lot a lot of work on that on that, and finally, finally, it came together, and um, then. <laughs> When I wrote the end, they never, they did not change a word of my end, which I, um, except we had a fight about um, a tear. That was it. Um, what's Who's his tear? name? Brent Spiner's tear. Oh, Data. Interesting. Data. I had him oh. have a tear and they fought me on it and they won, obviously, so that he didn't have a tear. So, I mean, I understood, I understood, but I thought it would be interesting. Uh, they went, when they were shooting on the set, they, the, it was short. So they called me from the set and they said, we're short. You, you have to expand this. And I said, where are you shooting? And they said, we're on the bridge. So we need to, I said, okay. So I wrote the, the first scene, the one with uh, Denise, and uh, Warth about the bet in an hour or whatever, while they were calling me, I think they called me 20, 20 times from the set <laughs> saying, what's the scene? I said, you're never <laughs> fucking getting this scene if you don't stop calling. <laughs> so anyway, so that was it. And she loved that. I remember we did the script reading. It was the only script reading I was allowed to be in. Oh, what can I tell you? Interesting. Um, so, so yeah, so we were doing the script reading, and um, and Denise was reading the script, and she said, "If I had had scripts like this, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have quit." She, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so because that, you wrote, me, you never wrote forgot. her character very well, and you gave her things to say and do that made sense, and and it was like, well, this is how you use the character. It's almost like. In this particular episode, the way you use Counselor Troy, we've been saying this whole time, nobody knows how to write for Troy properly. There was a couple of instances here and there where her mm-hmm. skills were used properly when, you know, uh, uh, 
um, Frakes was stuck on the planet and she was able to sense where he was and that he was going through difficulties. That that was a good use of her skills, certain times in the negotiation periods. But other than that, she's usually saying obvious things to people, right? Um, pointing out things that we just, anybody can, with a set of eyes, can could can understand like you know i think he's mad like yeah he's mad he's just choking mm-hmm. the guy of course he's mad but this time she actually kind of solved the puzzle for us uh, yes. at the end of the episode which was great yes. well she had to redeem herself because she fell in love with a fraud even though he actually was in love with her i believe that uh, i think so too to, uh, to this day but you know he is he was who he was but he was in love with her um, for um, almost a selfish reason for for what he what she could do for him. Right. You could make Always. me. I think I wrote it down. He says, "I need you. You could help me change. You could be my conscious." Like, that was deliberate. Just so you know, mm-hmm. that was absolutely. It's so interesting. It's, let me just go a little farther off here. Listening to you guys talk about the dialogue. I mean, I'm remembering it, whereas I haven't, you know, thought about this script in a, in a very long time. But I, 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 I think it's a good sign that I actually remember the intent behind the words from something that's 30 years old. So, mm-hmm. so I, I just have to say thank you for bringing me back to that. I appreciate it. Well, thank because- you for writing dialogue. That has yeah. meaning behind it beyond just driving a story forward, right? You're yes. giving, uh, you're giving the characters a voice and a personality and depth, and you could tell that there's there's deliberate intention behind it beyond again beyond just you know driving the story forward. You're also uh, examining the the human experience or the half beta zoid or quarter beta zoid experience. And so these kind of things click with us a lot of times when when we hear something that works. Thank you. To me, that's what Star Trek is about. I mean, actually, to me, that's what all television is about. It's it's about the human experience and how it is presented and then how people relate to it. And I want my work, whatever it is, whether it's the book or or the soap operas that I did or any of it, if people don't relate to it, it's a waste of my time and my life. And so, you know, why bother, really? Mm-hmm. The money's not uh, good enough. Oh, sorry. And, speak, and, speaking of, <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of relating, I, I thought that the, the scene between Crusher and um, Troy the, the that's in the backdrop behind Ryan there. Yes, it's famously I love known that more for, scene. yeah, famously more known for the leotard action yeah. and, and the scratching than the dialogue. But I thought the dialogue was great because it was two characters confiding each other, um, personal moment of you know, kind of what should I do type thing. You know, like I, I'm feeling this way, and I, I thought that was also another great. Um, character building thing for both characters, for them to be interacting and being like, you know, friends talking to each other. Thank you, because I don't think we saw people interacting as people enough. Women, certainly. I mean, these women are up on a starship going through the universe and they will have friends. I I have friends. I have my friends have gotten me through my life. Why would that be any different for Deanna or Beverly? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, she's she's got a kid. Beverly's got a kid. She she lost her husband, whatever. She was in love with what's his name? So uh <laughs> yeah. Picard. And, yeah. and they, need yeah. to, they need to be people though. Yeah, they need to they still need to be people. Otherwise, why yes. are we watching? We don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. You know, right. at least. I don't. And so. I think in the third season here, this is the first time we actually see the two of them having a conversation uh, between the yes. two of them. That's not just like, oh, it, you know, three seasons. A heart to heart. Yeah. 
a that was very moment. deliberate. And wait, didn't didn't Maurice get rid of her? The second se- when yes, was she yes. on the show? Second yes. season, she was yes. out. Yeah. Yes, they brought in the other Dr. Pulaski. Yeah. <clears throat> Who I, which which I, which she did a great job, but it was hard the to make the transition. The yeah, the, it was. Uh, well, for the audience too, like w- 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 all of a sudden, one character's gone, yeah. another one's in. There's no, there's not Thank enough. Thank you, Maurice Hurley. He didn't. He hated her. <laughs> yeah. But I did like again the dialogue. You know, um, the who counsels the counselor line. I thought was very poignant because that was, that was what he was doing. He was counseling the counselor until she reversed it back on him, but. In right. the beginning, he was doing the counseling, like, oh, here we go again with here comes Counselor Troy, you're gonna do one of your, you know, diagnostics on me. And it was very neutralizing the way he was doing that it's, to her. Being a counselor has got to be a very lonely existence. Yeah. Because you're always there for other people and no one is there for you. Yeah. Totally. And this is the first time we saw the counselor's office, which is also, I think, a first so far. Uh, Ryan, you said it was going to come eventually, and and now mm-hmm. we see Deanna in an office that, you know, of her in, own. And I thought, why anything. doesn't she have one? Yeah, why doesn't anything. she have one? She doesn't just yeah. hang it on the, you know. You can't just talk to her in the hallway. Like I want to, no. if, if I reserve no. time, to talk to the counselor. and she's not going to make <laughs> house calls into you right. Know, Everybody on the ship has probably got a roommate. So mm, what are you yeah. going to do? Think about That's it. That's funny. <laughs> exactly. Well, Hannah, that we have so much more to ask you about, but we're just about out of time here. I do want to point out, please tell us about Fortune's Son. Uh, ah. You did mention a book a minute ago, and yes, this is you. that book. Can you tell us about it? Um, here we go. I'm going to show it, but it's going to be reverse. <laughs> 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 I worked on this for like, a long time in in between um oh thank you in between gigs and jobs uh it was an idea i had when i oh my god when i was working on emergency and went up to seattle so the book is set in seattle i you know as i say it's only been the last few years and uh it's about a uh, a dad who's a cop whose son is kidnapped and it's about their relationship. And there's a little teeny, teeny, teeny bit of Star Trek in there in Ooh. that. Not really, Ooh. but that the kid <laughs> has a gift. So there, you know, I can't seem to write anything where there's not something where there's something special about someone. So the kid okay. is slightly psychic. So um, I was very, very happy with the way it, it turned out. And it's a mystery and it's, it's a father-son relationship. And um, mm-hmm. I'd love I to love those. I love father-son relationships. Well, he de- he definitely does. That's, well, everybody, the, that's everybody, the heart of the book, basically. You can get this oh, yeah. book, everybody, uh, wherever books are found. We'll include a link or a couple links, uh, Amazon and Barnes & Noble for everybody. You can just go right. in the description box below. Click on that link and uh, treat yourself. Yes. Hey, sometimes it's okay to buy yourself yeah. gifts, by the way, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and if you love uh, her writing, Han- Hannah has given us some great episodes when the boat breaks. Uh, I mean, just so many great episodes of Star Trek of television in general. I mean, we didn't even go back to some of my favorites like Knight Rider and MacGyver. <laughs> Uh, we'll, wow! We'll leave those for later. Oh my God, that is but, going oh, back. That is yeah. so good. <laughs> but but still, we love it, and, and it means that your you know your longevity shows that you have skills to me. And um, if you love uh, Hannah's writing, then I would definitely go out and get that Fortune Son uh, book because you put a lot of time, as you said, into it. it. Means there's a lot of art and thought going into that book. Thank you. Yes. I think I think they'll enjoy it. And Everybody go uh, check yeah. that out. And Hannah, yeah. this has been so much fun. We really appreciate you Thank taking you. the time and answering all of our yeah. questions for us. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was it was fun. It was a pleasure. I appreciate it. You've been awesome.
Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Thank you. All right, everybody, stick around. Uh, we've got much more to uh, cover on this episode. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. <laughs> 